let me begin with a question. What do you think is the biggest problem in the church today? Hmm. Wow, that's deep. Yeah, that is deep. Deep. Maybe. <laughs> Division. Division. Division is a big problem. <clears throat> what else? Not putting Jesus first. Okay. That's sort of... Um, how do you do that? How do you put Jesus first? What does that uh, mean? Do you mean his word does much? Like his word? Like what he said? Um, he's Yes, the, maybe his his word. Well, he is the word in the Bible. Mm. Um, he's our reference point, but we have so many um, temptations outside of the mm. church that take us away from from that word. Yes, that's very true. Somebody else. What do you think is the biggest problem in the church today? Satan do. <laughs> okay. He says pride. Where is Ken? How come I, I can't hear him? Um, Ken is in a public place. And, oh, speaking of that, um, this has asked me to remind everyone, if you're not speaking, mute yourselves and then take the mute off when you want to speak. That way <clears throat> we won't get any feedback. But right now it seems like we're not getting any feedback, so I think we're okay. But he's in a noisy place, so he's oh, texting oh, to us. Oh, he texted it. All oh, right, okay. Yes. I was going to say the same thing. Pride. Um, mm -hmm. That there's a lot of pride and arrogance and a lack of uh, humbleness. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> I would say that's probably one of the biggest problems I see as I view the church, especially in America. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, but when you think about the churches in different regions, do you think there's different problems in different regions? Like, what is the biggest problem in the Balinese church? Mm. Control issues. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's pretty good, Serena. I can tell you've been around for a while. Yeah. Control <laughs> issues. Uh, I would agree with that. Um, someone else, what do you see as being the biggest problem in the Indonesian church? Joining the culture and the religion, like tradition. Yes, that's, that's good. And I think that relates quite directly with our passage that we're going to look at tonight. So hold on to that thought. Someone else, what do you see? Is some of the biggest problems in the church in Bali? Culture. In what way? In what way? You're getting close, but in what way? Uh, well, sometimes the organization, I mean, the, the way the organization is, they relate to the culture. In other words, the organization follows the ways of the culture sometimes and not the ways of the Bible. I can say like that. I can say it like that. Kevin is saying traditions and culture. So there are cultural elements that mm. enter into the church. And when we read these letters, we're going to see that. And Jesus speaks to it directly. All those thoughts, they're all very good thoughts. We're going to pick up with a church called Pergamum. And you'll find this in Revelation 2 verse 12 and we want to read from verse 12 to verse 17 verse 12 to 17 of revelation chapter 2 does anyone want to read this for us yeah i read from um, american uh, version bible version mm -hmm. yeah okay message to pergamon and to the angel of the church in Pergamon write, <clears throat> the one who has the sharp two-edged sword says this, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast my name, and did not deny my faith, 
even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you, because you have there some who hold the teaching of Balaam, Balaam who kept teach, teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit acts of immorality. Thus you also have some who in the same way hold the teaching of Nicolaitans. <laughs> Repent therefore or else I am coming to you quickly and I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, to him I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone, which no one knows but he who receives it. <clears throat> okay, so as we, we, as we begin, I want to point out that all the letters follow a certain form. And, and what's the first part toward, of the form of the letter for each of the letters? There's a form. What is it? Look at verse 8. Look at verse 1. Look at verse 12. It always says to the angel of the church. Yeah. Right. right. So back in the days of Paul, letters followed a form format. We follow a format right now, both of business letters as well as personal letters. Well, <clears throat> you begin with who is addressed, and it's the angel of the it's Jesus is the message is coming from Jesus. He describes himself as the sharp two-edged sword, the one who has this, the double-edged sword. Now, isn't this interesting? Because on last Sunday we were looking at Ephesians six, and we were talking about the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and then Hebrews chapter four, verses twelve and thirteen. Um, talked about uh, the scripture uh, being a sharp two-edged sword. And so once again, we see this imagery of scripture being uh, the, the sharp two-edged sword. So what's the first thing that this person who holds the sharp two-edged sword says? Is it positive or is it negative? Lifting. Is it positive? In verse 13. Okay. The is first it part is positive. Um, actually, all of verse 13 is, is positive. So, so <clears throat> what's the first thing he says? I know where you live. Okay. What's important about that? I know where you live. Because he's all seeing. Okay, but there's other hints from the texts about he's why that's important. Um, he's understanding the situation. He understands oh, the situation. I, okay. Uh, okay, so there's different cities. Some were good cities, some were bad cities. Was Pergamum a good city or a bad city? Bad city. Why? How is it described twice that causes us to know that? Because they follow the, the wrong teaching. <clears throat> That's one of the characteristics of, of, of the city. But do you see how the city is described as a place where Satan's throne is? and where Satan dwells, in verse 13, two times he brings it up. He's basically saying, this is sin city. This is Satan, uh, Satan city. 
Um, what cities in the world today do you think would get that kind of a designation? As the place where Satan dwells. I heard last time that it probably is some city in Africa. Okay, that's interesting. Um, I haven't been to Africa. But when we think of Asia, what cities in Asia might be the place where somebody would say, Asia or Europe, where, where Satan dwells? By Bangkok. Bangkok, why? Um, because of the sexual, um, it's, it's known as a sexual destination. Right. Uh, Bangkok and Pattaya are the two, two of the darkest places on the planet when it comes to some of the sins that were mentioned here. And so he says that Pergamum was the place where Satan's throne is. This is where Satan sits. This is where he exercises his control, okay? And in the middle of this, how is the church described by Jesus in verse 13? They held fast to their faith. Or he calls it my faith, actually. Mm -hmm. They hold fast to their faith in Christ. And even though somebody was killed, was martyred there. Mm -hmm. So in spite of the fact that they lived in Sin City, and it was a place where Christians were terribly persecuted, and he mentions this man named Antipas, who was a witness for Christ, who was killed, uh, among them, even though they live amidst that terrible environment, they hold fast his name, they did not deny the faith. Mm -hmm. What can we learn from this? They were strong in Jesus. Yes, we can learn the first thing, which is dead mentioning is that we can stand firm in Jesus wherever we're at. Someone else, what's something we can learn from this? I believe when we're standing fast for Jesus, we are being looked after as well. Well, Jesus sees us, and he, he's with us, and he's encouraging us. Now, it was a church that had some good points, but it's also a church that had some bad points. And let's talk about it. Um, how many bad points in verse 14 does he say he has against them? He has a few things against them. Probably about five. <laughs> yeah, quite a few. So he says, I have a few things against you. Okay. <laughs> What's the first reason? Well, you're following, you're following, you are, you have people within your church that are following ideas of those that Balaam taught. Right. Now, it's a little bit unclear here whether he's talking about separate things or this is all part of Balaam's teaching. So what are the other things he, he mentions? What was the teaching of Balaam? Um, that the people of Israel, um, he was the one that taught Balak how to make the people of Israel sin, and they sinned by eating food offered to idols. Okay. And by committing sexual sins as well. Right. Okay, so uh, they held to the teaching of Balaam. <clears throat> now, this is an interesting story, and it's a story that I read many times in the book of Numbers, chapter 22. And we have to take a look at this, at this story, because if you want to understand why it is that Jesus says this particular thing to the church, you have to see the context of who Balaam is, what he was asked to do, what he did, and what was wrong with it. Because at first glance, Balaam doesn't necessarily seem like he's a false prophet. He actually seems like somebody who's only willing to speak 
the word of the Lord. So we got to turn back. Everybody turn back to Numbers chapter 22 in the Old Testament. And I want us to read the first eight verses to set the stage. Who wants to read the first eight verses of Numbers 22? Numbers 22, 1 to 8. Okay. The Israelites traveled on and camped in the plains of Moab, the other side of the Jordan River, across from Jericho. Kim, King Balak, son of Zippor, saw everything the Israelites had done to the Amorites. He and all the Moabites were frightened of all the Israelites because there were so many of them. They were very afraid. The Moabites said to the leaders of Med Median, this huge group of people will destroy everything around us, the way an ox eats all the grass in the field. So King Balak sent some men to Balaam, son of Baal. Balaam was at uh, Pethor near the Euphrates River. This was where Balaam's people lived. This was Balak's message. A new nation of people has come out of Egypt. There are so many people that they cover all the, all the land. They have camped next to me. Come and help me. These people are too powerful for me. I know that you have great power. If you bless people, good things will happen to them. And if you curse people, bad things will happen to them. So come and curse these people. He's talking about the Israelites. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe then I will be able to defeat them and force them to leave my country. The leaders of Moab and Midian left. They went to talk to Balaam. They carried with them money to pay him for his service. Then they told him what Balak had said. Um, verse 8 as well. Balaam um, said to them, stay here for the night. I will talk to the Lord. I will tell the answer he gives me. So the leaders of Moab stayed there with Balaam the night. Okay, so read this story. Is Balaam a good guy or a bad guy? Just based on the first eight verses. Bad guy. Well, he's, 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 he's missed guided I'd say because he's talking about the Lord in one breath but he's he's um he's um gone to a group that's a little bit misguided about their um about God about um, their faith. Yeah. So um, I would say, I would say he's a bad guy <coughs> because he wants to curse the people who attacks or who treats his people and by cursing them that makes him actually a bad person. The, the key to what the problem is with Balaam is verse 7. Everybody look at verse 7. Who wants to read verse 7? Me. Okay. So the elders, the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the peace for divination in their hand, and they came to Balaam and repeated Balak's words to him. Okay, so what's what, what's wrong with this? <clears throat> mm. Well, in my script, it's got they carried with them money to pay him for his service. Yeah, and <laughs> my yeah, so. My version says, um, the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the fees for divination in their hand, and they came to Balaam and repeated Balaam's words to him. Balaam was a prophet for hire. He was a sorcerer for hire. Balaam was a person who took people's money to either bless them or curse them. And in this instance, he decides that he's going to ask the Lord which one he should do. So he tells them, he tells them, sit down, wait for me. I'm going to go check it out. I'll get back with you. 
And what he should have said was, no way, Jose, I'm not taking your money to try and curse these people. So just the fact that he entertained the notion, even though he went and sought God and God told him not to do it, the problem was he should have never done it. Is everybody following me? Mm -hmm. Now, with that in mind, turn to 2 Peter chapter 2. Okay, so in this passage from actually about from verse 12 up to 15, Balaam is mentioned again. And the context beginning of verse 12 are people who are going to be judged, people who God calls unrighteous, who he's going to keep under punishment for the days of judgment. And so this is a big description of these people. So beginning in, in verse 12, with this description of bad people for being kept by God for judgment, we read these words. Who wants to read verses 12 to 15? Um, but these, like unreasoning animals, born as creatures of instinct to be captured and killed, reviling where they have no knowledge, will in the destruction of those creatures also be destroyed, suffering wrong as the wages of doing wrong. They count it a pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are stains and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions as they carouse with you, having eyes full of adultery and that never cease from sin, enticing unstable souls, having a heart trained in greed, accursed children, forsaking the right way they have gone astray, having followed the way of Balaam, the son of Baor, who loved the, the wages of unrighteousness. Should I go on or is that? Yeah, verse 16. Okay, but he received a rebuke for his own transgression, for a dumb donkey speaking with the voice of a man, restrained the madness of the prophet. All right. So, do you see the problem with Balaam in this passage? People who have a heart trained in greed, forsaking the right way, they have gone astray, having followed the way of Balaam, the son of Baor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. Do you see that? So when scripture in the New Testament <coughs> reflects on scripture in the Old Testament and the story, it gives us the interpretation. And that's why we know that verse 7 of Numbers 22 is the key to interpretation. It was the fact that the elders came and they had the money in their hand. So he sees the money and he says, wait here. I'm going to go check it out. I'm going to come back. And then I'll tell you. And so, so what happens here um, is that he is, he is seen as being someone who did something wrong connected to his love of money. So let's go back now to Revelation chapter 2. Pastor, can I ask? Yes. Yeah. Uh, is this... Balaam in the Revelation that we are studying now is the same person with the Balaam who is in Numbers. Yeah, because he, is. because he isn't there. His teaching is. You see that? I have a few things against you because you, you have there some who hold the teaching of Balaam. Who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel. Okay, so, so what we have here is, is it someone who's following the example of Balaam and the teaching that he did where he took money to go and do something that was unrighteous in God's sight. Yeah, so what's like a, a fortune teller. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's like a fortune teller. And going on, what's the next sin and problem? We mentioned the greedy part. What's the next? He uses his title as a prophet, as a holy prophet. 
Okay, but getting right back to verse 14, what's the next thing in line after mentioning Balaam? Well, are we Peter, second Peter? No, we are in, we're back in Revelation 2, verse 14. He puts the stumbling block of the, to the sons of Israel. I mean, okay, but, what's, but what's the next thing connected to that? Eating things sacrificed to idols. Right. Now, Paul allows this in, in his letters. People could eat things sacrificed to idols unless someone was testing them by saying, oh, this has been sacrificed to idols. So if somebody was testing them, they were not supposed to eat because if that happened, then it looked like they were compromising their faith if they ate. So they're, a myth. they're in the middle of a situation of a city full of idolatry everywhere, and idolatry is often connected to food. Let me tell you what I saw in Taipei last week. We're in the middle of ghost month. And in the middle of ghost month, before the full moon, everybody puts their food out and sacrifices it um, to the idols. And I took all these pictures and I posted some on my Facebook. And these are educated people. These are people with bachelor's degrees, master's degrees. And in every single business, everybody was coming out, setting up the table, setting up the food, putting the incense in there, burning the paper money to the spirits of their ancestors and participating in what Christians believe are idolatrous practices. And this may not be something you'd see in London. It may not be something that we would see in New York City, uh, but it is something that you see in some cities. And you see idolatry everywhere in Bali. What are some of the times that you've seen it? Um, I, I please forgive me if I, um, um, I, I mean, I didn't want to put someone down. <laughs> I mean, some people down. But I am. Um, how about the Halloween? I'm disagree with these things. Is that idol? I mean, because we wearing the ugly things on our face and then we mm -hmm. scare people. I think many Christians think that that. Um, it is wrong because they're celebrating demons or things like that. And kids are dressing up like witches and Satan and stuff. I used to dress up like a vampire and I had glow in the dark teeth and I had a, <laughs> a black cape and uh, Halloween was my favorite, my favorite holiday each year because I could scare people. So I'd hide behind the big tree in our front yard. And when a car would come by in the road in front of our house, I would jump out and go, <laughs> like that. and then, God, you dare to do that to me. <laughs> oh, uh, I was bad. Uh, 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 okay. So I dressed up like a vampire and I had Ooh. the most amazing glow in the dark teeth. And I scared a lot of people. Like one of the things I did is, is I took a palm, big palm leaf, a palm front, and I tied fluorescent, um, fluorescent fishing line. String wire. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I threw it over the power line and then I hid behind the, the tree where I was hiding and I put the palm frond lying down like this in the middle of the street. So when a car would come, I would pull on the string and the palm frond would go up in the air like this and I'd shake it like that and it was right at the eye length of, of the driver and then right before they'd hit it, I'd pull it so it would go up like that and, and I could see the people screaming, you know, and <laughs> it, it was a lot of fun. Um, but it was probably wrong, Mary S. So <laughs> probably should. Have done yeah, that. there's there's a lot of Christians and churches that boycott Halloween, or they'll they'll have a harvest festival at the church instead. So they say, you know, bring your kids to the church instead of doing all that mm -hmm. witch stuff. <laughs> But, but the maybe, I, wonder, what? No, I was just thinking, but um, in, in my version, it says, um, 
um, to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Right. I was I I, I was thinking that could mean more like um, they've sacrificed something and you, you know they're eating that but they've sacrificed it like a sacrifice rather than like just like a, a celebration with um a fantasy but they've actually sacrificed something is that not what that means uh, that's very possible and the point is is that they participated in a ritual that involved food being sacrificed to an idol and Christ had already given himself to be the sacrifice, so there's no need for sacrifice at all. But then this food was not sac sacrificed to Christ, as the Old Te Testament Jews continued to do even at the beginning of the New Testament period. This instead was full-blown idolatry, where they were eating the food that had been sacrificed to somebody other than the triune God. So the, the problem is it's, it's that they're worshiping the wrong God and their way of doing it is wrong. So there's a double problem. But my, my point is, is that in this bad city of Pergamum, the Lord is most upset about the way people are using their money and the way they love money, actually. Number two, he's upset over idolatry. And what's the third thing he's upset about? In verse 14. Fornication. Yeah. Fornication. And idolatry goes hand in hand um, with immorality. And right after that, he mentions the t teaching of the Nicolaitans in verse 15, which had to do with ritualized immorality, where in order to participate in the idolatrous ritual, people frequented temple prostitutes. So, so the point is, is that there was worship going on, and there was worship mm -hmm. going on that involved immorality. And this was a very, very serious thing. And mm -hmm. there are some there who did that, he says. And some, in the same way, hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. So this happens. Um, it, happens in, it happens in the church. It happens that people creep in. And then the church doesn't look like the church anymore. It looks like the world. Mm. So we have to balance welcoming sinners with the grace of Christ and challenging sinners to repent in light of the lordship of Jesus Christ. Because notice, that's exactly what Jesus did in verse 16. What is his message to this church that has immorality, idolatry, and a lot of love of money in it? Repent. Repent. Mm. Change else. your hearts and your lives. Right. Repent, therefore, or else. Or else what? If you don't change, I will come to you quickly and fight against these people with the sword that comes out of my mouth. Right. Mm. He, Jesus is threatening to come and slay them with the word of God from, mm. from his mouth. Now, that's a scary picture because remember the first time christ comes he comes as the lamb of god who sacrificed but the yeah. second time he comes back he comes back as the righteous lord to judge the whole picture of revelation is a picture of the coming second coming of christ to judgment and we have it here once again where during this time where christ has not come back it's the time of repentance so this is this is a, a wonderful time because we still have time to repent. But if you don't repent, then Christ is going to war against the people who don't repent. And he's going to war against them with his word. But once again, we're right in the middle of spiritual warfare again. And we see the place of, of the word of God in, in the middle of the warfare. It is only the word of God that can change people. It's only the word of God that can make a person alive. It's only the word of God that can strengthen a person in the battle. It's only the word of God that gets a person's attention so that they stop and they think, oh, I need to repent. God's word says this. So what, 
what do some of y'all think when it comes to this? Anybody want to make any comments? So this is this is this is something that hasn't happened. This is something that has not happened. Saying is going to happen. Right. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> I personally believe it's a picture of of the final judgment. Repent, or I'm going to come back, and then you're going to be judged according to to my my word back back then. So. But the main point is repentance. And this is our message to sinful people who live in sinful cities, who follow idols, who love money, and who are committing sexual immorality. Repent. Now, is that the message that people are getting from the church today? You need to repent? Yes or no? Is that the message people are hearing? Or are they yeah. hearing about, about your best life now? Probably your, probably your best life now. Yeah, there's a lot of your best life now type teaching out there. My biggest issue with Joel Osteen is that he doesn't preach about sin and repentance. I've never heard him say the word repent. Ben says they're hearing your best life now, no repentance or else. And and this is the problem. <coughs> I just dropped my Bible. Um, this is the problem, and we see it all through oh, no. the, the, the churches today. There are a lot of churches in Bali that are that are growing big because they have really nice worship and things. But that doesn't mean that the people are being told that they need to repent of their idolatry. In mm -hmm. other words, if you're a Hindu and you want to become a Christian, you have to repent of a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're not being told that money isn't the greatest thing in the world. In fact, you're supposed to love money. Uh, even in the church, I see the way people uh, view money, treat money. Um, I can tell there's a love of money. There's often a love of money when people don't have enough of it. But often when people have a lot of it, there's still a love of it as well. So you can have poor people who aren't greedy, and you can have rich people who are very greedy. But, but what I see is the church does struggle with this love of money. The church struggles with idolatry. and certainly. The church struggles with immorality. It's everywhere. Without getting into the details, my my last week, you know, it's it's I've had to deal with so much immorality, um, not with members of our congregation, but with people who members of our congregation are reaching out to, and then the effects of of immorality, and the effects of immorality can be very very serious. Some. Um, one of the people I'm helping, she's gotten sexually transmitted diseases. Um, another, uh, there's another person that I'm talking to this week, and um, sh that person has gotten pregnant um, out of wedlock, and she she was thinking about an abortion. So all these things are happening because of immorality, and and I got really mad this week at immorality because I got mad at these guys because these guys break up with these girls after they get them pregnant. And they want to force them into an abortion so that they don't have to accept responsibility. And uh, one of the guys who got one of the girls pregnant is a guy that I know. And I was so mad when, when, when I heard about it. I called up our mutual friend and I was talking to our mutual friend about him. And I said, this is what he did. And, and I said, and my friend said, well, how are you going to respond? And I said, well, part of me wants to... Um, pick him up and beat him silly. And I said, the other part of me wants to give him the gospel of Jesus Christ. So my friend said, so what are you going to do? Give him the gospel or beat him silly? Um, but I actually said something much more rude. I said I wanted to take a knife and do something to him, which I'm not going to explain on the, on the video. But you can imagine um, what, what it is given the subject. But I was so angry. I was angry at how immorality has hurt people that I love in Bali. And Jesus feels that way, not because he's a killjoy and doesn't want people to enjoy sex, but because he knows that it has to be in its proper context or it's immoral. And people get hurt and babies get murdered. And it's very sad. And so Jesus is constantly saying in the midst of sin and sinful people, 
repent, repent, repent. And even Christians, this was a letter to churches. They're following the teaching of Balaam. Some of them were falling, falling into immorality and idolatry and greed. So Christians are not um, immune from being tempted to these not things. Not at all. Not at all. So we, we've got and to realize this. Bali is actually a, a den of iniquity. It, you know, uh, once midnight comes and I always say the cockroaches come out at night. <laughs> mm -hmm. There's so much drinking and then it leads to no good thing. Um, people just and drink. There's, and they, mm, yeah. there's so many prostitutes in Bali that are going around all the nightclubs and and the um, bars as well. Yeah, one of the things I was dealing with this week is a prostitute had trapped a friend of mine and then had um, texted him, got text information, and then she put it on her social media where she has 5,000 followers on Facebook to expose this guy to ruin his career. So it was a setup. Um, we actually, I think all of us in KICC are well aware of this going on. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Mm. But my point is, is that the message of Christians in the midst of this is the message of Christ. Repent, or Christ will come to judge. But right now is the time of repentance. So you can repent and get right with, with God. Repentance is a great cleansing. Yes. Now, he brings this to a head in verse 17. He's given his message, but now he's dealing with the response. And what does he say about the response to the people in verse 17? He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Why did he say that? Why did he say that? Mm -hmm. He who has an ear, let him hear. Because he doesn't want to see them uh, ruined <laughs> or dead. <laughs> Not everyone that has ears actually hears things too, either. You know, you have to be exactly. listening, with, listening with your heart as well. There's, there's sort of a play on words here. Um, we can hear, but yet not obey. So when he says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, he's, think of it like this. He who has a willing heart, let him obey what the Spirit says to the churches. You see? Because mm -hmm. we're not talking about the act of hearing with our ears. We're talking mm -hmm. about the act of obeying with our heart. Mm -hmm. So let us obey what the Spirit is saying to the churches. And then he ends verse 17 with a promise. And what is the promise? He will give us, he will give them a hidden manna and also give the white stone. What is white stone? It means, Pastor. Um, it goes back to some of the symbolism in the Old Testament, where they took okay. stones to commemorate. Um, mm. to, to, to commemorate, but here uh, the stone has to do with receiving your your new name, which means like you know how sometimes when people were baptized, yeah. uh, historically they got a Christian name, yes, and and their name. It was switched. So it's basically talking about um, these are all pictures of eternal life, receiving hidden manna, having the white stone, having a new name uh, written on it, which no one else knows but he who receives it. It's promises of basically what Jesus will do to grant salvation to those who overcome, who don't give in, who hold to Christ no matter what. So they're living in Sin City 
and they're challenged to hold to Christ no matter what and to repent of all the ways in which the world has gotten into the church. So here's my question. How has the world gotten into the church that we're in in Bali? Everybody becomes strangely silent at this point. <laughs> <laughs> we hear, we listen. <laughs> I haven't been in Bali long enough and I haven't been in the church long enough to be able to ask this question. So how has the world crept into the church? If Jesus were writing a letter, writing a letter to KICC Bali, and we know that the message is repent, what would he be saying we need to repent of? Describe what's wrong with the church at this point. We, um, we have had a problem um, we had to put in the bulletin and we and on the overheads that if anyone asks you for money in the church that we do have a social committee that you can mm -hmm. come to um, and we can talk about something um, but a lot of um, visitors were getting targeted money wise okay so then there's that love of money that is connected with with Balaam uh, wrote something on his response he said that if if jesus wrote a letter to kicc bali about what they need to repent of it would be a long letter <laughs> <laughs> oh my but so one of the sins mentioned in the new testament i mean in the in the newsletter that went out is people need to go to the social care fund if they have special needs and not try and go after individual visitors and get money. Mm. Okay. What else? Um, we've had, we've had, um, what do you call them? Um, people in the sex industry in our church um, approaching men and saying that they can get other men for them or, and, and, even prostitute, you know, um, managing some of the girls in our church. Wow. So. But that was a long time ago. Well, it, it happens. And, and it happens in impoverished countries where people find it hard to get a job based upon the education or skills that they have. And when you see how bad Bali is right now, 77 thousand people lost their jobs because of the coronavirus mm -hmm. seventy seven thousand in bali that is and, incredible and that that means they had nothing to go back no foundation no pension no nothing to buy no supplementary income from the government no it's it's absolutely terrible and many of them went back to their hometowns Many of them have taken up agriculture back, back in the villages, but this is a terrible situation. And so what it means is, is that we need to keep our eyes open for the opportunities that are presented by this, but also for the sins that could creep into the church. Because I could imagine that, that sometimes people would, would be so destitute that they would want to sell their bodies. Um, in January of this year, when the coronavirus hit Thailand hard, and Thailand was the first country to close. Um, after two weeks of it being closed, one of my friends who we got out of prostitution 15 years ago, um, he and his wife fell on hard times because he drives a taxi and there's no foreign tourists to shuttle to and from the airport. And now uh, she was working in a tourist hotel um, restaurant as a cook and she lost her job because the rest front closed because the whole hotel closed because they were a hotel for Chinese tourists and Thailand closed it off and you couldn't have any any tourists so he didn't tell me but he sent his wife to be a prostitute for two weeks and then he, he writes me one day and he says I'm sad and I said yeah this economic situation is getting really bad and I said but why are you sad and he said because I sent my wife to the sex shop oh gosh and I said what and he said, yeah, if she gets a customer, we can eat for two days. She doesn't get a customer. Our family of four doesn't have anything to eat. 
So I, I share this story um, with my prayer supporters and people pledged enough money um, that I could fully support them for 10 months. So uh, um, within 24 hours, I was able to say to him, go and pull your wife out of the whorehouse. Mm. And that's what he did. But I don't judge him for, for doing that. Um, if, it's, if it's a toss up between selling your body or starving to death, and somebody sells their body to, to feed their kid, I'm not gonna judge that. But I am gonna say that sexual immorality is a sin that we need to repent of, and we need to realize that the impoverished environment around us creates situations like this that make immorality easier for people to do. Hmm. Does that make sense? No, it's it's a it's a it's a survival thing sometimes. It's, it, it? it's survival. I've done mm. so many interviews of sex workers in Thailand as I was writing my book, drawing lines, building bridges, and uh, I just heard story after story after story. Um, one guy told me he was uh, he was doing prostitution because his dad worked in a village, and the neighbor. Um, was having a ceremony and he had firecrackers. And when the neighbor blew off firecrackers, the man's father's ox got scared, jumped up and gored him to death. And so here was a man, 21 years old, having to support um, four, three other kids and his mom back in the village because dad was dead because of the firecracker um, mm -hmm. ox that killed him. And this is why he was, he wasn't gay, he was straight, but he was good looking and he thought, I'll come to Pattaya, sell my body and be able to take care of my little brother. And that's what he did. So I heard story after story mm. after story after story like that in my interviews. And it really, really got my attention, especially in, in impoverished countries that it's not just, oh, these are hedonistic people that like sex and, and just want to make money doing it. No, it's not that. These are impoverished people that feel like they have no other option in order to make $25 a day, so they have to sell their bodies. So it changed my paradigm of viewing people simply as sinners and caused me to see that they were both sinners and victims of the, of the situation that they were in. And so if we wanted to bring Jesus to them, we couldn't just tell them to repent. We had to also solve the problem of the economic situation. You follow me? So it becomes very complicated, but I could imagine uh, that, that soon we're going to have a lot more prostitution because when Bali well, we begins, open up. I'm sorry, I'm talking too much. Well, we have got a lot of it now in Bali, but of course there's no customers around. So I'm wondering about that part of it as well. Well, when, when they open up, there's going to be a lot of prostitutes because people aren't going to have a lot of regular jobs and they're going to want to make a lot of more money quicker. Um, the difference with Bali, there are bro brothels in Bali that get poor girls that are trafficked into Bali, but there's also a lot of girls that are running their own show and they really love the big money that they get. That's what I found out this week. That's not a survival thing. That's what I found out this week. What one of these people on their social media, well, what was a prostitute. And I went and I, I didn't ask, I didn't do a friend request on her, but, she, but her, all of her posts were public. And I went through it and, and I read it. And I could read between the lines of what she was doing. And so other people in Bali had said, yeah, she's a young prostitute. And so this is how she's making her money. And once they, they've got that taste of big money, there's no way that you will get them to come and work as a waitress or something. Even, you know, you can it's offer them hard. a job. Mm. It, it, it's very hard. So we see that the Bible that was written 2,000 years ago is very relevant to our modern situation. The message is the same. Repent of greediness, idolatry, immorality. 
and that if you do, there's a promise. And the promise is to him who overcomes, you're going to feast and feed on all the resources that Jesus gives you as he grants you eternal life. So Jesus doesn't just kill our joy and steal us from the culture around us. He rewards us with eternal life and eternal rewards. Mm -hmm. So in, in the midst of everything that he challenges us to do, there's always these wonderful promises to him who overcomes, to the one who overcomes. I will give this. I will give that. So often people focus in on what they have to give up in order to be Christians. But Christ makes people focus on what they gain. Mm. And what they gain uh, makes what they lose worthwhile. There's one place in the Apostle Paul's writings where he says, What benefit were you then deriving from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the outcome of those things is death. So what benefit was it to be living in sin, practicing sin, doing all these sinful things that you're now ashamed of? Because the outcome of those things is death. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So there's always this comparison. Don't stay in a deathly lifestyle. Choose life. Choose repentance. Choose eternal life. But it's a hard message when the culture around you, when everybody's doing it, you know. It's I hard. mean, as much as we, we're talking about the prostitutes, but there's certainly a lot of men who come to Bali for that very reason to use the girls. It's, um, it's a two way yeah. thing. Yeah. And we're talking not just with our church, but, you know, with the, the pedophilia that's gone in, on within churches. That's terrible. Under the, under the, you under know. Under the radar. Yeah. Well, this certainly gives us cause for prayer, don't you think, as we. Definitely. Just, that's probably our secret weapon. That is our secret weapon. And we need to pray against this city where Satan's throne is. Is Satan's throne in Ligian or Kuta or Dinpasar or Ubud or Ubud? Where is Satan's throne? If some of you were placing Satan's throne in Bali, where would you put it? Kuta. Kuta. Or well, maybe out at Changu now. <laughs> May have I, yeah, I think I might put it in Changu. They go where the people are. Yes. It's very interesting to, I just think that um, the sin around Bali is where we should be as Christians and to showing people the Lord more. Yes, and not be afraid to go into the into the places or go to the people who are involved in those things. But what, what I see is, is the church miserably fails because they think that we're, we're going to bring people to our building. Mm. No. The church um, needs to go to the people. Pastor, um, the, the schoolies from Australia, when they finish school, they come up and have a wild time in Bali. Mm unbelievably wild times some of them lose their lives but um there is a christian youth group um i think they range from about 18 to 23 that come up and sacrifice their time and go around the bars they help girls home to in taxis and help anyone who's drunk they they keep them from um getting into um situations they're just an amazing youth group from all over australia and they go out and, and look after the schoolies saying that that kuta has more prostitutes than any other place yeah and he's saying that's why our church is so important mm. yes that's what i was saying before that we need to address this problem mm. i would think I think we need to 
we, we need to address it. There's a lot of similarities between Pergamum and Bali. So this, this message of, the, of Jesus to the church in Pergamum seems to be very relevant to us right now. Well, I'm not going to go on into the next um, the, the next uh, church. And the reason is because I, I, I want us to sit on this message and think about God's call to repentance and how we might pray for people who need to, to repent. Um, I think that's very important. Um, so we might end up finishing um, a little bit earlier. Because um, I, I missed... Um the beginning and um you were talking about the um the doctrine of barlam uh and stuff are, are you going to send a recording so i can watch that bit Pastor yes tim uh, i i okay. i'm recording it i'll i'll send it we we looked at uh the book of numbers chapter 22 uh primarily through verses one through nine and that gives us the the, the main um teaching that shows us what it was that Balaam's sin was. And Balaam's sin was, is that he was willing to take money to go and curse someone if God said it was okay. So uh, he didn't just tell them no when they came. Um, he didn't just immediately say no when they asked him to, to do this. He saw the money. And so he said, wait here. I'll be back. Let me check in with God. And so this uh, teaching of Balaam comes up in Second Peter chapter two, verse twelve, twelve through fifteen, uh, when we see this problem of Balaam, Balaam's sin being loving the wages of unrighteousness. And so, when people love money more than anything else, then they will do anything else. Uh, we have a saying in my house that goes like this: There's two kinds of people in the world. There's those who love people and use money or those who love money and use people and give me two minutes with any person anywhere and I can tell you that person loves people uses money that person loves money and uses people and 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 to be honest um but one of the things that's hurt me the most since coming to KI CC is is the false accusation against me that I'm doing this for financial reasons. Um, I don't think that I love money. I think I love people, and and I say that so I can say to others, imitate me as I try and 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 imitate Christ. But people have impugned my motives and things. I'm not even getting a salary right now, and I haven't for several months, um, because the church isn't making any money during this time of of the coronavirus. I am not doing this because I love money. And so for someone to accuse me of loving money, I would rather them accuse me of having a girlfriend on the side um, <laughs> if they want to falsely accuse me. But, but don't accuse me of loving money because I would give people the shirt off of my back. Um, and each month I've got our budget worked out and and we've been giving away between three and six thousand U.S. dollars every month um, since since January, and we try and live frugally um, so that we can give away as much as we can to all these people who are hurting and starving. And 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 so the the sin of loving money is something that I never want to be charged with. You know, people can charge me with other things. They can say, Pastor Tim, sometimes you're you speak with a dirty mouth. You say the S word. You say the F word. Yes, I have done that. Um, and so th there, there is sin in my life that I need to repent of. But I don't think that loving money the way Balaam did is one of my sins. I have other sins. But it's God not. knows you have, Pastor Tim. Yeah. The, 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 <laughs> That's the, all you the, have to be satisfied with. <laughs> the, Lord, the Lord knows our, our hearts, but I'm trying to hammer away the fact that this love of money is a terrible thing. It is. It's a. It's a. It's a real curse. It, I, love, a, I love making awful. money, but I love giving it away. <laughs> yeah, I love making it so I can give it away. 
like, <laughs> like one month I got several hundred dollars in royalties on my books. I'm like, yes. Mm -hmm. And I gave it away in five minutes, you know. Yeah. So, and you get so much joy from that. Exactly. You, you, get a, you get a lot of joy from helping other people. So the word of God needs to challenge us in the areas where we do have sin. Some people it's covetousness. Some people it's idolatry. Some people it's sexual immorality. Some people it's compromise. But there are these problems that, that we see in the church. And every church has them. Every Christian has them. But we just have to personalize the message of repentance. Where Jesus says repent and receive his promise of blessing. That's what we need to do. Can I ask a question that I don't quite understand? I've heard Please. the word mana used a lot, and I'm not sure. It, it says, I will give you the hidden mana. What does that actually mean? Well, Is, <coughs> mana in the Old Testament was given by God on a day-to-day -day basis to his people when they were wandering around in the wilderness. Remember that? He gave them manna. Oh, the okay, says, the, the food that just appeared out of the ground. Right, right. So yeah, I sort of thought it was holy food, but I didn't quite right. understand. So Jesus says that he has food to eat that we we know not of, and that his food is to do the will of him who sent him. So so the point that we that we get from the scripture is that the idea of hidden manna is basically um the the food that we feast on, which is Christ, who is the living bread. He's the bread from heaven, um, who coming into the world gives life to the world. So these are all pictures of Jesus. When it talks about the hidden manna, it's talking about um, the, the nourishment that comes from Christ that ends up being eternal life. So okay. there's all these connections and parallels to the Old Testament that we find in Revelation, and one of them is manna. Mm, so we've, that's, um, we've seen Balaam and manna, two, two Old Testament references. I've got elderly Christians um, that live above me, and they want me to meet them tomorrow and tell them all about my study tonight. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. And, <laughs> and um, can I tell you the continuing story of the girl that I've been... Um, I want to hear that, that that committed so tried to commit suicide. Yes, she please. someone found her and she went to the she went to the hospital and Jose has cleaned his life up and he's come back and they are both going to church and they weren't going because I I've, I've given her um, some scriptures from the Bible and just you know even the night she was going to take sleeping pills I said no one has the right to take life unless it's God and um, so they're they're both they've decided to follow a spiritual path wow. in fact Jose um, remember Jose I took him to the church the night before he um, flew out yes. to Spain yes mm. yeah. and we exciting. and we prayed over him that so is really exciting. they've never quite forgotten that because when when and also the Ukra Ukrainian girl when she had nothing else she had some spiritual friendship from me you know that I was telling her about Jesus mm -hmm. wow so well um, prayer made a difference didn't it Oh, prayer from everyone made a difference. It's just um, been wonderful. And they, she can see that, that you know, the, she never would have thought that she could be happy again. <laughs> yes, wow. they're eating out of rubbish bins, but they said they are truly happy, you know. Well... It's okay to eat out of rubbish bins. When, of course it's um, okay. To, to me, it's better eating out of rubbish bins than prostituting yourself. Well, I'll, I'll tell you a story. Um, when, when we were in, in transition back to the mission field and I was no longer receiving salary from the Chinese church where I was in in Boston but two, two years ago, um, 
I raided the dumpsters every night to get food. So I, um, I would go and get bread and bagels and donuts from the Dunkin' Donuts. Um, <laughs> and then uh, we had two Indian grocery stores. <laughs> so they would throw out eggplant and, and different vegetables and everything. So each evening at 12 o'clock at night, I would go out and do my thing. And then the next morning, Evie would wake up and see what all we, we, we got. And she made this excellent uh, eggplant uh, casserole. And then I put it on my Facebook, you know. <laughs> so uh, we got so many donuts, like 60 pounds a night, you know, and, and got these fabulous bagels. <laughs> oh, my. So eating out of the dumpster can really – it's just some nice stuff sometimes. Well, so. well, they got enough timber to make a bed. They didn't have a bed, and they got an mm. old fridge out of the dumpster as well. There you go. And One that, man's that trash probably, is another man's treasure. Absolutely. Um, well, this has been good tonight. I think we've all been challenged to think about our situation in Kuta, to pray for the situation, because it's going to get worse before it gets better. And just to ask God to be standing in the midst of our church. Don't take the lampstand away. Let's keep our lampstand in the middle of Kuta. And now, as some of you <laughs> share prayer requests, are you with us? I'm going to ask you to take the prayer request. I need to run yes. to the restroom real quick. Oh, okay. Uh, can you take prayer requests while I run to the restroom? Yes. Okay. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Church families in Taiwan. Uh, it's a uh, a Taiwanese woman and an American man that are married, and she needs to be in the U.S. a certain amount of time to um, qualify for American citizenship. And so she had to make a trip by herself to the U.S. this last week, about a week ago. And I, I don't know how long she's got to stay there, maybe a couple of weeks. And then um, when she comes back, she'll have to be in quarantine. So I think she's a little stressed about it. The rest, the rest of the family is doing okay. <laughs> she has a teenage daughter that can cook, but uh, her name's Anita. So we'll just pray for Anita. She's a Taiwanese woman that has uh, an American family. <laughs> I went and got some hidden manna. <laughs> Did you find it on the in the desert? <laughs> oh my gosh! See, yeah, I the desert in the refrigerator. The bathroom, but I wanted some chocolate too. <laughs> so <laughs> I went and got the hidden manna, and now I have to repent. So I'm repenting of <laughs> my. You don't <laughs> look very repenting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if I sit and look at how big my belly is in this um. <laughs> it's really not that big, but because I'm a trumpet player, when, when I breathe, I breathe from my diaphragm, and so the air comes out, and then I look like I'm a pregnant, you know, moose, or is it something <laughs> like that? So, so I just went to the gym, and I breathe very deeply, but when I breathe, I'm like, <gasps> I look like a moose, you know. So, <laughs> Incorrigible is what comes to my mind. <laughs> yeah, well, so, somebody looked at our, somebody looked at our KICC Bali um, service and left a comment saying I was fat in the comments. I'm like, oh my god, you know. So, really? mm -hmm. yeah, one, of our, one of our friends in Taipei that you, we, we, when we were at Friendship Presbyterian Church in Taipei, she was there, <laughs> and she often just puts these funny little comments on <laughs> Facebook. Well, I didn't disagree with her. Uh, what I said to her is, I said, I'm working on it. <laughs> So that was my way of saying, I'm trying to repent. I mean, I did my exercise today. I rode my bike 7.5 miles, and then I went and worked out for an hour before the Bible study. So, but then I had my secret manna. So I guess that wasn't very good. So I need to, <laughs> I need to repent of all my secret manna. I have it hidden I all over the house. I have to congratulate you on the color of your shirt. Your nice, that really good Bright color looks good on you. Hmm. Thank you. Well, hmm. I'm just glad to be I'm here. I apologize for last last night. I wasn't feeling well. I just couldn't do it. But tonight, 
was lively. I felt good. You guys felt good. We got all the way through one of the churches, and we learned a lot. I learned a lot about Kuta. Oh, um, hit chat. Uh, that everybody, either Christian or not, may realize the meaning of this pandemic that God revealed to us instead of the devil's tricks. I believe God wants us back to nature, come in unity and repentance. Mm -hmm. I mm. think that's... That's beautiful. So we need to pray for that. And pandemics brought us to repentance, brought us back to nature. Mm. We, we, yeah. have duck, we have ducks in our swimming pool and the caretakers put a big owl up on the wall because ducks often fly at night and they're quite frightened of owls and it's working. I've seen that in the United States too. The farmers put a fake owl out. So yes, that, uh, and they're really frightened. And then yeah. a little baby, our native little tiny um, owl is called a moorpork. And because it makes a sound like more pork, you know, uh -huh. and it was sitting beside the toy, uh, the you know, the, <laughs> the artificial owl. Yeah. <laughs> can I, can I, I just say um, that yes. going going back to like um, you having the comment um, from that lady <laughs> about being fat, I feel like. Um, as much as people can give us, like, you know, point us in the right direction, I, I personally feel like people shouldn't give advice unless they, you know, you've asked for it because <laughs> it's kind of, you know, quite, it's quite, it's quite difficult, isn't it? When people sort of like launch it, even like, you know, other Christians, I was put yeah. off going to church because, um, they launched into what I should and shouldn't do. Yeah. So I feel like partly that mm -hmm. that can be quite off-putting when people start to, to say things to us like what we should do about our bodies or things like that. Because you haven't even asked for that, for that advice. No, I, I didn't ask for it. But um, I think your point is very well, well, well taken. We need to be very sensitive. We need not to be judgmental. And not to be somebody else's lord and just to, to love people and not to give advice unless it's asked for. The last comment was, I ever made on a person's body, I think, was in church. It was in 1994. And I remember the woman's name. Her name was Jackie. I won't say her last name. But I was standing at the door greeting everyone on the way out as I did every week. And I asked her when the baby was due. And she said... Oh. She said, there's no baby. I'm just uh, fatter. Yeah, but the, the problem is one oh of the God. elders, one of the elders of the church told us <clears throat> he thought she was pregnant and he was mistaken. Well, we all thought she was pregnant <laughs> and I stupidly said something about it. So ever since then, let's not make a comment on somebody's body. So I learned my lesson and now I don't say anything. Um, and if somebody wants to tell me they're pregnant, great. Come tell me you're pregnant. But you can you can have you know the baby's right out there, and I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to pretend like it it's not there, unless somebody says something. And then, we, but we we need to balance two things. In Romans chapter 15, Paul says, "And I myself am convinced that you yourselves are full of goodness." filled with all wisdom, and able also to admonish one another as well. And so the ministry in the church in Rome was to admonish one another. Admonishment means you, you take someone's weakness or their sin, and then you point them to Christ so that they'll, they'll learn and, and they'll grow. So there, there was a ministry of mutual admonishment. The problem is, is that people come in, and it's not necessarily a direct sin. And so they're judging us on the basis of, like, I grew up in a Baptist church, and then <clears throat> Baptists didn't believe in drinking. There's nothing in the Bible that says you can't drink alcohol. There's a lot that says you can't get drunk, but there's nothing that says you can't drink alcohol. But I grew up in a legalistic church that said you can't drink. So when people come into our lives 
and bring their own standards of what works for them and then dump it on us and try and bind our conscience, then that's, that's not right. And um, well, well, also I think it's good for us to have some Christian friends or a, what we used to call an accountability group. I don't know if you hmm. hear that word much in your churches, but here in Taipei, that was a popular thing in the English churches and fellowship, youth fellowships and stuff, to have a close-knit group or a small group a uh, core group or prayer group or whatever of closer friends. And then you would keep each other more accountable for daily things, you know? So like if, if a, a close friend was like started dating a non-Christian, then it would be up to her close friends or his close friends to tell them, Hey, remember, you know, if you date somebody, that means you're looking for a partner in life. And if that person's not a Christian, they, they won't make a good partner for you. So that kind of thing, you know. So I, I think the closeness of the relationship uh, can give the person more Freedom right, more of a right to be in your yeah. life and kind of um, confronting. I about think that a good Christian mentor is, is very good. Um, I don't necessarily um, agree about uh, that a good a Christian good Christian friend can tell you what they think is wrong with your you know the instance of the um, having a non Christian partner maybe that guy you know maybe it's a different way around that they could suggest that she bring him to church or in a, in a, another way he may want to change to be Christian. Yeah, that, that's a complicated one. I run into that all the time in mm. Taiwan. Uh, um, because God majors on bringing people together rather than tearing them apart. But the Bible does say, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. And Paul says to, to the one who lost their spouse in, in 1 Corinthians 7, that they are free to remarry, but only in the Lord. And so there is a principle, and there are verses that clearly say, that we who are Christian, when it's our opportunity to choose our marriage partner, should only be married in the Lord. Too much of people just coming in and judging, and especially when they don't know us well enough or don't love us. I try and not say anything to somebody about what's wrong in their life unless I'm sure that they know that I love them. And, that, and that, I that, think... Mm -hmm when they know that you love them, maybe one day you'd confide in them about you right. having trouble with your right. weight or I'm having trouble with my weight. People tell me all the time, you have to put weight on and what are you doing? And I say, mm. what would you do if you were me? <laughs> yeah, for, for me, um, I really uh, love people when they talk to me, even criticize me, but in personal, I mean, because I know that when people, uh, they tell me something or remind me or warn me, that means that they love me. But I mean, tell me in the like uh, personal, not in the public so that yeah. put me down. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I, me too, I, I learned to, when talk to someone, I, I learn, I'm learning to not put them down in the public, but yeah, or right. face to face, yeah, or in the, just only me and her or him, something like that. And, and let, let me close with this. One yeah. of the things we saw from, from our study tonight is the encouragement that Jesus brought to the Christians when, when he talked about the good. And I think a lot of the problem I see is, is that people major on criticism rather than encouragement. And I just wish that people would not see their main job as being criticism. They'd see their main job as being encouragement. And if they did, then rather than make pot shots about my weight or something like that, they could say something like, wow, you know, you seem to be joyful in the Lord these days. You know, how do you feel or something like that? They could... They could focus on something that was positive. And mm -hmm. there's just a lot of 
mean and nasty people out there, even in the church, that are always looking to be critical. And I hate to say it, but it, it's out there, and you've been hurt by it, and we uh, we might have been hurt by it ourselves different times, and, and it is sad. But if we could do what Jesus does, let's begin with the encouragement. Um, mm -hmm. That that would really be nice now, wouldn't it? Yes. Yeah. I believe yeah. so. Yes, the, the the whole point of being the way Jesus does and ha being encouraging takes away the kind of um, the nasty side of it because mm -hmm. you know what is behind that idea that someone has to come get us and tell us off like it's not a nice thing. So if people immediately do it the way Jesus did and think, well. I'm going to do this for their own good. So I'm going to come at them from a nice angle. Then the person doesn't, uh, feels that and realizes that you, you, you've got a good intention, you know? So right. that's, that's the reason Jesus show us that, hmm. that there's a way to tell people that they are sinning. There's a way to tell people, um, you know, and, and, and that's in the Bible. And it says there is a, he shows us there is a way we, we're going to, we're going to be kind first. We're going to, we're going to give you, Absolutely. show you, you have to be positive in the way that you speak to each other, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, that's good. And that's a good note to end on. And may God help us all to be, um, mm -hmm. all to be in encouragers and, and, can you close us in prayer and remember to pray for the things that people have mentioned? Okay. Uh, okay, let's go to prayer. Father God, thank you for this evening. Thank you for our gathering around your word again. We thank you for teaching us through your word. We want to lift up the, the requests and burdens of, of uh, those that, that are here and some who are not. Uh, on this stream tonight. We, we pray for the pandemic situation, Lord. We pray that we would all be spiritually awake to your purposes in, in bringing this about as a spiritual warning to all of us in the world that you are God and you are Lord over our lives. Lord, help us to... Um, trust you in the midst of it and we pray that you would bring an end to it soon we also pray for the people who are suffering because of the pandemic that that either got sick or lost their jobs or just don't have any tourist work we pray lord that you continue to provide and that the church would be able to help i want to pray for dirk that you would heal his eyes and help him to stabilize and not to not have more vision loss and for Anita who's traveling in the United States that you keep her safe keep her healthy and help her not to be anxious and worried about her family while she's away and we we ask all these things in Jesus name amen amen, amen. okay Father, can I just lift up Pastor Tim with his Sorry. migraines yeah okay. sure I think yeah. You need some serious prayer here. <laughs> yeah. Um, dear Holy Father, um, it, it's um, it's a real problem for Pastor Timothy to be getting these migraines all the time. Father, I just ask that you will um, just cast them out of his body. Father, mm. cast out whatever is happening and show him, show him something that he might be doing to um, bring these migraines on. But Father, these have got to stop. Father, we just ask you earnestly um, to, to take this, this burden away from him, Father. Mm. And we ask it in the name of our precious Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you Amen. so much. Amen.